Hero System started as a game of superheroes, and even though it did get adapted into all manner of other genres over time, much of what it does is rooted in characters with all kinds of strange but thematic powers you'd see in American comic books. Or in My Hero Academia if you're a piece of weeaboo garbage. References that'll be dated in a few years' time aside, we're going to talk today about one of the things that really makes Hero System sing. Power Frameworks. In the intro to Hero System video that I did, I mentioned that Hero has a sort of consistent internal logic that isn't explicitly explained. And one of the pieces of logic is that power frameworks can be thought of as the power to have more powers. That comparison will make a little bit more sense when you start looking through how advantages and limitations interact with power frameworks. But if you're completely new to this concept, Put the last few lines out of your mind for now and just worry about the basics. Basics such as how every power framework requires that all the powers in them follow a theme. The term they use for this in the rulebook is special effects, abbreviated as SFX. SFX is a very broad category. It can range from being one of the elements, such as fire, ice, or lightning, or a method of affecting the world, like psychic powers or magic spells. It's also possible to be more specific types of magic and psychic powers, like necromancy or telekinesis, or it can be alien gadgets made from a super advanced technology. And of course, some power frameworks work better for certain concepts than others. For example, a multi-power does a better job representing a suit of power armor, while a wizard with a wide stock of freshly brewed magic potions would use a variable power pool. Power frameworks don't really change much between the two editions. In fact, much of the text is verbatim across 5th and 6th edition. The most glaring difference I noticed was that elemental control isn't included in 6th edition. Other than that, they both say pretty much the same thing on power frameworks. Meaning, what you find in this video very likely applies to whichever of the two editions you're using. Keep in mind, though, that a video by some deranged Bavarian on the internet is no substitute for reading the rulebook yourself, especially since I have a history of having overlooked a detail here or there. Videos like this are a secondary resource, useful for getting information on a topic, but could possibly be a little distorted for one reason or another. Your rulebook is your primary resource. It's the heart pumping the blood that I am adding my own interpretations to, so that you may pick them out of the bloodstream later. But disturbing metaphors aside, let's get on with the rule discussion. Elemental controls are the classic superhero ability of having a bunch of related powers, usually like controlling fire or ice. You know, the elements. They allow you to pay a large amount of points up front to get discounts on a few related powers. The first step is you buy the base cost of the control. This determines the minimum strength of every power in the elemental control. Each slot you buy must have an active cost equal to or greater than the base cost of the control. This is because the base of the elemental control gets added to the active cost of every slot. Meaning, if you have a 30 point base for an elemental control, and you get a 30 point base cost energy blast with no modifiers, your active cost for the energy blast is actually 60, 30 from the base, and 30 from the energy blast itself. And you can also buy a ranged killing attack slot for another 30 points, and if left unmodified, that'll also be treated as a 60 point ranged killing attack. So for 30 points for the base, 30 points for the energy blast, and 30 points for the ranged killing attack, you spend 90 points on these two powers using the elemental control. By contrast, if you were to buy these two powers independent of an elemental control, you'd spend 120 points, 60 points for the energy blast, and 60 points for the ranged killing attack. As I mentioned earlier, it's possible to have powers that can cost more than the elemental control, such as getting a lot of advantages on a single slot in an elemental control. In fact, advantages can only be applied to the slots in an elemental control. If you have a power that has an active cost greater than the base control, you determine what the final active cost of the slot would be and subtract the base from that to get the active cost of the slot. Limitations can be applied to an individual slot, 
but if it affects every slot, you can also make it apply to the base cost of the control, lowering the real cost of all the slots as well as the base. Now, one of the drawbacks to the elemental control is this. Drain and suppress are much more powerful against an elemental control. If one slot is affected by a drain or suppress, all slots are affected, as well as the base. This means that 20 points of drain takes away 20 active points from the slot, as well as from every other slot in the elemental control, and 20 from the control itself, making every power effectively lose 40 active points. Elemental control is the most straightforward, but technically not available in 5th edition. Though, it could just as easily be ported into 6th edition, there isn't much that changes between the two editions. When building an elemental control, the rulebook recommends one attack, one defense, and one movement power. Though, if your theme for the elemental control would be conducive to destruction such as fire and heat, or laser eyes or something, you could justify having various attack powers with it. Multi-powers are one of the power frameworks present in both 5th and 6th edition of Hero System, and it's the best compromise between flexibility and depth. Multi-powers are a pool of points for using various powers. They're good for representing powers that can only be used one at a time, or powers that you can divert energy to. You have a set of reserve points, which is set aside so that you can move them around between various slots, and the slots are different powers you have available as part of the multi-power. If you have several powers that'll be roughly the same strength, this is a good option to go with, since slots for the multi-power are relatively inexpensive. Creating a multi-power follows these steps. You start off by buying the reserve. The base cost for the reserve is how much you can commit to slots in the multi-power. You then build a power to make a slot, and make note of the base cost and the active cost. The active cost of that power cannot exceed the base cost of the reserve, but it may be lower. You then determine the real cost of the power and decide if you want the slot to be fixed or flexible. For fixed slots, you need to use a number of points from the reserve equal to the power's active cost any time that you use it. The cost of this type of slot is the power's real cost divided by 10. For flexible, you may use less than the power's active cost when assigning points from the reserve. This allows you to use multiple powers at once from the multi-power. This slot type's cost is the real cost of the power divided by 5. For example, let's say you buy a 60-point reserve. This costs, well, 60 points. It means that any slot you get for this can, at most, be 60 active points. You then get a slot for a 60-point energy blast that is unmodified, making it also an active cost of 60. You can make it a flexible slot for 12 points, meaning you can then use this power at any level, so long as you have points that you can put into the slot. Let's then say you also get a force field, also at 60 points. Once again, also as flexible, for 12 points. You can use all the reserve points towards either power, leaving you unable to use the other. You know, going full offense or full defense. Either 12d6 normal damage from your energy blast, or 30 physical and energy defense from the force field. But since 30 defense might be a bit overkill, you can pull back to 20 points in the force field for 10 physical defense and energy defense, and still be able to use 40 points in the energy blast for 8d6 normal damage. You can apply this concept to a vehicle to create a spaceship from something like Star Trek, where the crew can choose what systems to put power towards. This variability also comes cheaper than if you were to buy two different powers for 60 points each. This power framework only costs 84 points instead of 120. A third power at 60 points would make the framework cost 96, compared to three individual powers at 180. While advantages can be applied to reserve to make it apply to all the slots, the rulebook recommends instead you apply advantages to individual slots, mostly because there's weird things that you need to consider if you allow advantages to the reserve. Weird things such as, how do you make life support have armor piercing? If you absolutely must allow advantages on a reserve, the answer is, you don't. If it doesn't make sense for a certain advantage to apply to a power, it simply doesn't change anything. Limitations, however, are a little bit more forgiving. They can be applied to one of the slots to lower the cost of the slot, or it can apply to the reserve, such as the form taking extra time to redistribute the reserve. GMs, exercise caution. 
Variable power pools can be absolutely game-breaking. These are available in both 5th and 6th edition. Variable power pools are a pool of points for creating any power, so long as they follow a particular theme. You basically get a set amount of points that you can freely build any power for. Then, if you find that a particular power is no longer necessary, your character can spend time in-game to change their powers out for a different set. Kind of like preparing different spells in Dungeons & Dragons, except instead of having to choose from spells your class knows, the powers you make need to match the theme of the variable power pool. You can't make a fireball spell if your variable power pool is supposed to be a bunch of spare parts you build gadgets out of, but a gun that launches fireballs is acceptable. Variable power pools consist of two parts, the pool and the control. They follow a ratio of two for one. That is, for every two points of pool you buy, you need to spend one point on the control. So if you buy a pool at 120 points, you'll need to have a control that costs 60 points. But if you have a character spend time in game to swap out their powers, you can divvy up that 120 points into any set of powers you need. No power in a variable power pool can have an active cost higher than its pool. You can have three 40 point powers or two 60 point powers, however many, as long as the total real cost of all the powers you use does not exceed the pool cost. Advantages and limitations can only be applied to the control cost though, never to the pool. Advantages can be applied to the control and they would affect every power in the pool. And this can lead to some interesting effects. First, any power created using the variable power pool that has an advantage applied to the control automatically has that advantage. Second, the advantage applied to the control does not impact the cost of the power created using the pool. But this also creates some weird edge cases, just like with multi-power. For example, how does life support have the advantage armor piercing? The book then follows up with armor piercing having no effect on life support. Limitations are the major point of consideration for variable power pools, and the limitations fall into three types. First, those that limit when the power can be swapped out. This can only be applied to the control cost. Second, those that limit what kind of powers can be made with the power pool. Again, this only affects the control. And last, there are those that affect the control and the powers made by the pool. Powers created under this third condition need to have the same limitation, and the limitations need to be worth at least as much as what is on the control. But you are allowed to deviate a little bit. For example, the focus limitation. If the control has an inaccessible obvious focus, then every power created using the pool needs to have a half point worth of focus limitation. Powers can accomplish this by either also having an accessible obvious focus, or they can have accessible inobvious focus to match the half point value. Or you can have obvious accessible focus to go for a full point value. It's otherwise not recommended to give limitations to the slots in a variable power pool if they don't also affect the control. After all, if a limitation for a power in a slot is bothersome, at the next opportunity, they can easily change it out for a version of the power without that limitation. And thus, a limitation that doesn't limit a power is hardly a limitation at all. Variable power pool is very variable and gives very much variety. But as I mentioned earlier, this is a feature that as the GM, you need to exercise great caution when allowing. One of the horror stories I've heard regarding variable power pools is that some players would try to use it to mean they can just have whatever power they need at any given time. As in, the very instant they needed to fly, they have a flight power. The very instant they need to stop somebody, force walls and entangles. One of the key aspects of balancing the variable power pool is making sure that the powers fit within a theme, as well as that they take significant time to change out. Though, if you want to include the ability to change out variable power pools, even in combat, the book does have some rules and guidelines on that as well. That said, the counterpoint to how easily variable power pools can get out of hand is this. They give a player a very effective means of trying out different combinations of powers and advantages and how they work out for them. This is a trade-off that in the right environment, such as a mix of newbies and supportive experts, can be very useful. To review, power frameworks are a good way to get more bang for your buck. 
They combine related powers together in a very superhero-y fashion with a few restrictions. Elemental controls, which are only described in 5th edition, are the least cost-effective, but the easiest to make use of. You buy the control, then you buy powers at a discounted rate, though anything that drains or suppresses one power in the elemental control drains and suppresses all of them. Multi-power is a happy middle ground. You buy a reserve set of points, and then you buy various powers at a significant fraction of the cost, but you can only use so many of the powers at once. And variable power pools are the most flexible, possibly the most cost-effective, and thus the easiest to unbalance the game with. Power frameworks are one of the more complicated aspects of Hero, but they're very much worth getting a grip on. I also feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this, though. I did skimp on examples in this video. In my defense, between the numerous examples in the rulebooks, and even more that can be found in the various splat books, using too many examples here felt a little redundant. Champions for Hero System 5th Edition does a good job illustrating what can be done with multi-powers. In fact, it even has a Dungeons & Dragons s pick some archetypes from a list, which includes a few multi-powers in them. And, being the now generic game that Hero is, they make a great starting point and allow players who aren't satisfied with how things are presented to make adjustments. Thanks for watching. If you found this helpful or useful, give me a thumbs up like. And if you like Hero System but want a game from a different genre, take a look at the Dark Eye. Unless you're from Germany, of course. In that case, you're probably sick of hearing about Das Schwarze Auge. With all that said, I am Aron der Schädel, and I will see you all next time.